With this movie and the couple that follow, we'll begin our final animation into this one sequence that goes with the broader story from the storyboard. We'll be importing some of the pre-existing animations that have been made, and we'll take a look at this scene and see some special ways that have been set up to make your life as an animator a little bit easier. Finally, when we finish this off, we'll go ahead and look at some considerations when we get into the rendering of it, just so you can be prepared to deal with some of the things that happen with Anime Studio Pro 5. All right, let's take a look at the scene and see what we've got here. Obviously, we've got an imported frog you can barely tell right there, and let me zoom in on the workspace just a little bit. We're at timeline zero, so there has been no animation applied to the frog, and in fact, there's no animation applied to this scene yet, other than having the camera move into position when we go to frame one. Let's explain a couple other things that are going on here that we will use, or that you've probably come across, but maybe didn't notice or realize the importance of it when you saw them in the preferences and presets. Let's take a look at our scene settings real quickly. Since this movie is for a web deployment, we'll open our project settings and we'll be sticking for proofing right now at 320 by 240, which is kind of a standard web format. Additionally, we'll be sticking with a frame rate of 24 frames a second. This is not fast enough for broadcast television or if you're making DVDs, it needs to go up to the rate that's common for your area. In the United States, it's an NTSC rating of 29.97 frames per second. And if you're in the UK or any of the European countries, it's less than that for the PAL format. This is going to be about 20 seconds long. And so at 24 frames a second in rough numbers, 20 seconds is about 500 frames. So we'll change this to 500 frames. Additionally, we've got this set as sort to layers, where we've engaged this option because we definitely want things appearing in front of and behind other things. We also want to have the ability to animate that, and the only way we can do that credibly and easily is using the sort layers by depth function. I'll select OK. The other things we've got going on is that for the sky layer down here in the lower right hand corner and the hills layer, there are some special features engaged for that. You'll notice that the sky layer is small. It's only slightly larger than the actual render area that's going to be rendered when we do our scene. But let's open the layers palette and take a look, or I should say layer options, and take a look at one of the things that's been engaged. I've engaged the option immune to camera movement. What this allows is that, let me go ahead and close that. What this means is that when we move the camera around the scene, the sky is always going to be in the background. And that's important for me because when we do a quick render, I've got this nice gradient going on where it's lighter near the ground and then darker blue at the top. I don't want to have to have a huge square or rectangle on the back. I need to keep resizing to get this nice color variation in here. Additionally, I want this color variation to remain consistent throughout the camera move. I'll leave this open and we'll take a look at something else that's going on. We've got the hills here in the background. That happens to be the second layer. That too has the option for immune from camera movement slipped in there. So this will also help reinforce the false depth of field because as we move in the trees and everything move around closer to the camera, this in the background won't, so it will look farther away. For the hills in the background and for the base grass of this render, instead of engaging the camera depth of field option, what I've simply done for each one of these layers, let me open those options again, is enabled the blurring capacity for those layers with a blur radius of two. So it's kind of fake camera depth of field. It actually renders faster and it gives me a nice soft look and allows the viewer's eyes to focus in a little more quickly on the areas that are in sharp focus instead of fuzzy focus. So both for the grass and for the hills, I've got that softness going on. You'll see some different naming conventions that I've got going on here in the layers palette. This is something we haven't dealt with until this point in time. Behind each name, I've got Z and then I've got a number. This is a layered file with all new layers occurring at Z depth zero. That's the distance, or I should say, between the camera and uh, the objects in the scene. The Z depth is that distance right there. They always come in at zero. The sky, I want the furthest back, so I've got that at Z negative one. Where do you find that again? 
by engaging the Layers tools. You'll see up here in our header bar that we can control the layer positioning X, Y, and Z. The hills itself right now I've got at negative three, but I don't have anything selected in that layer to show that off at the moment. So as we go up the scale here, I've got the grass, this large grass area at depth zero. I've got the trees at depth 0.1. So negative moves away from the camera and positive moves towards the camera in this case on the z-axis. The frog group has been imported into this scene. Now when you go look at the working files there'll be two frog master actions. One says group and one just says actions one. We built all the actions on action one. And I'm going to keep that because when we import, we can do that by eyes by itself, mouth by head. However, I also want the option to bring in the frog in its entirety and not have to keep importing each layer. So with the frog group, I can do that all in one click. We've got the road Z depth 0.3, and then we have the blades of grass at Z depth 0.16. And I actually should probably bring that behind the road just so I can uh, keep the orders straight in my mind. So that's how this is set up initially. In our next movie, when we start, we'll go ahead and animate the frog. We'll use our actions palette to easily and quickly create some expressions for our frog. And then we'll begin importing those automobiles with cycling motion.